All right, well, um, thank you for having us tonight. Um, it's so great to be here. I, as has been said, am part of a news organization in Justice Watch. We've been around for about a year now. Our launch was last November, I believe. Um, and we're really thrilled to be a part of this community. A lot of cool people in this room doing cool things. Um, and I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about what our organization does and specifically about a project we did this past July on uh, Chicago Police Department street stops in Chicago. So, um, yes, yeah, so this is our organization, our mission. We are a nonpartisan, not for profit multimedia journalism organization that conducts in depth research exposing institutional failures that obstruct justice and equality. Um, so, like I said, we've been around for about a year now, and we like to take a look at the criminal justice system in Chicago and then sort of use that as a lens to explore what's going on nationwide in the criminal justice realm. Um, so, for this project specifically, it was me and Emily Horner, who's in the back with us tonight, and um, she's a reporter, and I'm a reporting and graphics fellow. Um, I did undergrad at Northwestern, studied journalism, and she is a Medill grad student, so both from Northwestern, go Cats. Um, and both of us have a background in journalism. Um, we are starting with Injustice Watch to really explore data and everything, and I dabbled in interactive design while I was at Northwestern as well, but um, I think we're both really coming at it as reporters. So that's a little bit about our background. Um, so now I will talk about the story. Uh, this is a quote from this story. Um, it's basically really about you know a problem that Chicago has had um, in terms of rebuilding the public trust in the police department while aggressively fighting crime. Um, and sort of a sentiment that we had been finding in our reporting was that to aggressively fight crime, you have to increase stops on the street. It was sort of like stops on the street is a necessary evil in that vein to um, curbing the violent crime rate. And of course, summer months are the most violent in Chicago and we were coming out with this project in July. So we wanted to explore that topic. Um, and so, our data was from the ACLU of Illinois. Um, it's working on this project was actually a dream because we got the data from them pretty clean, about as clean as it could get. Um, and if you, I think the slides are gonna be sent out, um, but the report can be found at this URL uh, that the ACLU put out in 2015 about stop and frisk in Chicago. It actually found that people in Chicago were getting stopped at um, larger rates than in other cities, including New York. Like um, even, I think there were more stops this study found in Chicago than there were in New York, not controlled for population or anything. So obviously this is a, something that's happening in the city. Um, and so the data we have is about, is all the stops in the city that did not end in arrest uh, for a specific period in 2014, May through August. Um, and the reason we have information on stops that did not end in arrest is Chicago police are required to fill out what they call a contact card for each stop on the street that does not end in arrest as a sort of way to record, you know, where these stops are happening and um, requires the police to sort of keep track of uh, the reasons that they're stopping these people. And the number of stops we had from May to August of 2014 that did not end in arrest was just over, it was about 256,000. So that's 256,000 stops in that period um, that were not leading to arrest ultimately. Um, and these are, you know, stops, police stops. It's not just any um, interaction of the police with the civilian, it's stops. Um, yeah, so, and I should note that those numbers have gone down since 2014. Um, we, I don't remember what the number was for 2015, but uh, the reason we wanted to look at this uh, data from 2014 was it was sort of a peak for Chicago and, you know, with the um, 
increasing tensions and relations with police relations with the community. We wanted to just give, really reiterate and give a glimpse of what it looks like when stops are kind of, you know, getting excessive in the city. Um, so a little bit about the data that we had. Uh, again, 256,000 stops. Um, we had the street address to the nearest 100 blocks. So if it was like, if the stop happened on 3912 North Ashland, we had 39XX North Ashland. Um, I think it was kind of an effort to, um, you know, keep private residences and businesses private, you know, not attract attention to that, but still give a good um, picture of what the location was for a stop. And we had race, sex, arresting officer type of stop. So we knew if it was vehicular or other. Um, and then we had a few other things, random ID numbers. Um, uh, we did not have the names of people who were being stopped. And we did not have the descriptions of why the officers were stopping people. Um, so that was the first part of data that we had from the ACLU. And then the second part was they did take 299 contact cards from 2013 that did have descriptions on them, just to give a picture, like a, a random sample of reasons cops were giving for stopping people. So these are two things we visualized. I'll show you in a second what the final product looked like. But um, I just wanted to kind of take you all through the process of Emily and I looking at this data, how we kind of handled it as reporters, and then our thought processes for eventually visualizing it and giving a good um, ultimate user experience to really showcase the data. You know, the ACLU put out this study, but they didn't really, they visualized it in their study, but um, the full data set wasn't really accessible to the public in any sort of way. Um, so we just really wanted to give a full glimpse of what they were uh, finding. Um, so obviously we have a map, I'm sure many of you have seen it, but um, we wanted to really make sure that <laughs> we weren't just making a map to make a map. And so, cause I'm a little bit hesitant always as a graphics person to make maps. I think they're a little bit overused and we really wanna make sure that the point we're trying to make has a geospatial element to it before we make a map. And this obviously does, we are looking sort of at the, effect that policing has on particular communities. So we want to see if it's localized in particular communities and what these communities are. Um, so we decided to make a map, but um, obviously we don't have, we, we know anecdotally from our reporting, people we're talking to that police are, you know, stopping more people in these communities than in others, but we don't know that from the numbers. So our process was really kind of design a little bit, plot out these points on a map, see if it says what we think it's saying, see if it makes a point that we think we're making, and then keep on going from there. Um, so yeah, we have 250,000 data points. That's obviously a lot to comprehend um, for an individual's brain and also for a browser, and we wanted to make a client-side graphic for this. So. I kind of knew from the very beginning I was going to have to whittle this huge data set down into about 500 data points if I was going <laughs> to plot anything on a map. Um, so we spent a few days figuring out really what we wanted to do um, to get it down to that manageable size. And we thought about sampling it, but it didn't feel statistically responsible to just take a random sample of 500 from 250,000. Um, so our solution was to sort of pivot table. You know, we um, both knew how to use Excel and we both, you know, spent a few days just making all of these like random pivot tables, trying to make sense of the data. Um, and we eventually decided to pivot down to um, clusters of stops on particular blocks. So um, basically what that kind of looks like, first of all, we had to kind of, um, aggregate these three columns into one column and just get street addresses to the nearest hundred block. And then from there, uh, you can kind of see our process here. We um, got counts of the number of stops per city block. Um, 
And then we also kept race in there. So we knew we wanted to make a point and see if there's a racial component to this. Um, so we had the count of how many stops for each specific race that we had in there. Um, and that brought our data set that we were working with down from 256,000 entries to 28,000 entries. So in effect, there are 28,000 city blocks that we have counts for, frequencies of stops for. And um, obviously, many of these have just like one stop, two stops, three stops. So uh, we decided to do 77, 77 stops per block and above, which brought our data set down to 451. So basically, there are 451 of these blocks, the nearest 100 block, that have 77 stops occurring on them or more. And I think the most was around 575, um, which is a large number for sure. Um, so then I had to decide kind of what background we wanted for our data, what kind of map we wanted for our data. And I knew I wanted to use D3. Um, I use D3 a lot. But um, we had to kind of decide, did we want a street map or to look more broadly at community areas or census tracts is another thing that we thought about for a second. Um, and I thought a street map would be really cool, but um, ultimately decided to do the community area thing because uh, loading the Google Maps or uh, open street map base layer would just be another thing to load on the page and we had a lot going on. Um, and also, I, I, this isn't like a huge deal, I don't think, but there is that concern for private businesses and residences. We felt like if we are plotting on actual literal streets that people can see, there's still that component of people looking at it and being like, oh, this particular business is right here or whatever. Um, and we just didn't want to draw attention to that unnecessarily. Um, so I got a community areas GeoJSON from City of Chicago Data Portal um, and found this site for uh, geocoding the street addresses, put in all 451 street addresses, got the geographic coordinates, which then go pretty well with D3. Um, and so this is the map I ended up having. Um, and we wanted to obviously check in with the map at this point, make sure that our data was actually saying something, which as you can see, there are clusters on the west side and the south side. And then there are a few up here along in the loop in the um, north loop, but yeah. Mostly on the south and west sides. We had, our largest number was at O'Hare, which I, don't actually remember why that was, but um, it took us a while to figure that out. And then, yeah, so we had basically each dot represents, you know, a, a block for, and um, a cluster of stops anywhere within the range from 77 to 575, which is obviously a huge range. So uh, when we updated the radiuses of the stops to or the radiuses of these circles to reflect how many stops are happening on a block, with the biggest being 575 and the smallest being 77. You know, you obviously see that the blocks that are in the west and south sides are getting a huge number of stops versus the north side ones, clusters. And again, um, on the north side, the neighborhoods that you're seeing the most stops in are Edgewater, not Edgewater, Uptown, Lakeview, and Rogers Park, which are, well, Uptown and Rogers Park are very diverse neighborhoods. Um, and so now we wanted to kind of take a look at these stops. Since we had race data, we wanted to look at, you know, um, what the racial makeups are of everything. So um, this is a map where we updated the color of the circle to reflect the racial majority of stops that were occurring. Uh, so red is the majority black, yellow is the majority white Hispanic. They did distinguish between white and black Hispanic. And then blue is majority white. So as you can see across the city, it's overwhelmingly African Americans being stopped with a smattering of uh, white Hispanic stops sort of on the lower west side, and then just a few random white 
dots up there on the north side as well. Um, so at this point in the game, we kind of knew, you know, this, this point we're trying to make clusters of uh, stops occurring in particular communities was a point that, that holds up. Um, and then the rest is D3. I just, uh, what you just saw is basically what the map is. Um, SVG circles, the attributes are, you know, the obviously the geographic coordinates, the radius is a function of the frequency of stops happening on a particular block. Uh, the fill is a function of the racial majority of the stops we're seeing. And then on mouse over, I actually had a bar chart in the corner that updates and shows you the exact racial breakdown if you're curious. Um, and then we also decided that it would be important for our readers who aren't as familiar with Chicago's geography to be able to see uh, the racial makeups of these neighborhoods that the stops are occurring in. So our, our, we added um, race data to our base layer for the map to show the majority of um, the majority race in particular community areas. That data is also from the city's data portal. Um, and then we have results right here. Oh. I don't know if I can click on this. Oh. There we go. What's happening? OK. So this is the map you see. Um, basically, you can see a lot of majority African American stops happening on the south and west sides. And then obviously, those neighborhoods are the highest concentrations of African Americans in the city. And then this stretch along the Lower West Side is majority white Hispanic. And then you're seeing a lot of, again, African Americans being stopped in predominantly white neighborhoods on the North Side. Um, OK, how should I get back to here? So that was our um, stops map that we worked on. And then let's see, our second um, graphic, which I'll go ahead and just show you. Sorry. Was a random narrative generator. So we took our 299 contact card narratives that we had, which are reasons cops gave for giving a stop on the street. Um, and this data is actually from 2013 from the ACLU. And um, we had the full data set. Um, but uh, and they, they gave us the ID numbers to where we could have matched these narratives to the specific stops and gotten more information about them that way, but we decided to just kind of keep it simple. And as you can see, um, it just pulls up a random narrative. So you can kind of see what cops are writing for these stops. Obviously, a lot of them are very detailed. And some of them are not at all. Um, yeah. Observe, and then we we pull, we kind of combed through all of these and looked for sort of key words that cops were using to describe their stops. You know, obviously, suspicious, loitering, very vague words on their own. Um, and to stop a person, an officer needs reasonable suspicion that they're breaking a law. But you kind of we you know you would hope that they would articulate what that suspicion is, and sometimes we just found that that really wasn't happening. Um, so yeah, basically, that's just some simple jQuery. Um, yeah, so basically, that's simple jQuery feeding you random um, narratives, highlighted the words dynamically also with jQuery um, to just give you flag your eye if you're seeing these particular keywords that we're seeing a lot of. Um, and then as far as the presentation of the rest of the story goes, again, I'm kind of, you know, uh, did a lot of interactive design in school. So this is what I really have the most experience with. We have this, let's see, we have this contact card at the top. It's not working right now. I should refresh the page. Um, that auto fills out kind of just an animation that I made in Photoshop. And then um, at the bottom, we have 
four narratives of people actually getting stopped in the street. And at a Justice Watch, we like to talk a lot about how anecdotes are data and data points are anecdotes. You know, we have this map of all of these stops on the street to make a broader point, but then we wanted to focus in on the individuals and just talk about their experiences with um, Chicago police. So that's kind of what this is down here. We have photos of them and pull quotes and everything. Um, so yes, what's next for us? Um, this is just the first in a series we're doing sort of on how the criminal justice system is treating communities of color. Uh, differently than their white counterparts. And so our next part, we actually just came out with the first installment of a story on bond, the bail bond system. So um, that can be found here. Oh. And we also recently broke news about a lawsuit uh, regarding the illegality of the cash bail system. So that's another thing that's happening sort of in this arena. Uh, that we'll have more news for you on. And then um, the really exciting stuff is still to come. We had a batch of interns this summer uh, gathering a lot of original data on cash bail systems. So um, our next installment in the Bond series will have more cool visualizations, lots of data, and this time we you know, really collected it ourselves. So it's a really cool project that we're really excited to be working on. Um, and yep, that's all I have for you tonight, other than questions. So just make sure you give us a follow. Uh, and we're also on GitHub. There's not a whole lot there at the moment, but there will be. Um, and so yeah, I guess it's time for questions. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is yeah. the first question. Oh. Oh, go ahead. No, it, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I was wondering, what, what, uh, did uh, Justice Farmer, did anybody uh, do any study about work that uh, stops that they had? result in stopping crime or uh, uh, predicting crime? Yeah, that's a good question, Emily. Um, I think we found that an increase in stop wasn't predictive of stopping crime. What did, yeah. You can probably speak to that. Um, if you want to go through the story, we kind of talked about that issue a lot. Obviously, New York is like a nice example of what happened with stop and frisk. They had to stop you know, practicing that. Years ago, and so you know their crimes continue to go down, um, and so you know there has been like trouble studies. If you read through the story, there's lots of that. Next question. Yes. Um, that was just kind of where it hit. I kind of just mentally set an upper limit of 500 data points to be processed by the browser, and that was just kind of where the, it cut off. So <laughs> not really anything scientific, but I still think that um, what we showed was significant. Next question. Yes. Um, in your uh, this is a great presentation, by the way. I really, really love it. Um, the question I have is, in trying to gather the data, I know you were focusing on stopping um, or cop interaction neighborhoods. Um, but did you run into any issues in terms of, I think if I remember there was some debate about, about data in general with police, the number of police um, that have pulled their guns or, or had some sort of gunplay involved. Can you talk a little bit about um, if you've come across that, in, at least in what you were looking at, and, and talk a little bit about what the issues are in terms of the data? Because um, I, I remember right now, there there's some issues in terms of in terms of getting, gathering yeah, the data? Gathering data and gathering and getting some accuracy around it, so. Right, um, I don't really recall finding anything specific about guns, and again, um, this data was very nicely compiled by the ACLU, you can read the full report, it's very um, informative. Emily, did you come across anything on guns? Sorry, I keep deferring to you, but she did a lot of work on the reporting. We weren't like, looking for anything about guns specifically, but I know that a very long time to get that data set. Like they bought it for a very long time. So I think like getting data um, from any big agency can be really difficult. Um, you know, it's probably hard for them to, I don't know how well they keep it. And I know like, a bunch of the different city agencies are not like connected to one another. So when you're trying to, you know, hold data 
data that you know matters to two organizations. It can be really difficult because um, they don't like talk to each other. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. So yeah, no, I, I, I thought that there was some debate about the um, number of instances where um, the companies there was some debate about where you get data about if the companies involved with the interaction as well. Um, so that, that helps a little bit. Uh, next question. Yes. Uh, you had 299 uh, incidences from 2013. How did you choose those? The ACLU actually chose those. So they had the larger 2013 data set, but then just randomly sampled 299 of them and got the narratives for them. Uh, Eric. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, what? in the entire like interactive data presentation. I'm curious what the uh, sort of design process was and how you decided how you were going to present the data. Uh, did you like um, I guess user testing is not appropriate, but like did you did you like how did you try to figure out like, how to present the data in a format that would be easy to digest for like certain people or anything like that? Was there any consideration of like, the potential audience that you're trying to yeah, that's a great question. Um, we, again, I, I'll say again and again, this, again and again, this was kind of a dream project because we had this super clean data from the ACLU that already contained all of these, you know, important um, aspects about race and geographic location. That was all done for us. So I think like pretty much from the very beginning, we could just kind of smell it. You know, we wanted a map. We wanted to look at the geographic element of this story. Um, and then I, I sort of think, you know, from there, we knew we wanted to make a point about race. So, um, you know, coding the colors by racial majority and then color coding the neighborhoods by racial majority uh, followed that. Um, let's see what else. And then we knew, you know, we are primarily probably reaching a Chicago audience, but to make it amenable to people from all across the country, you know, presenting uh, background about the neighborhoods and their racial majorities and how segregated the city was. That was really important to us as well. Um, basically, though, this project was sort of like the ACLU has done this, of Illinois has done this beautiful work on stop and frisk in Chicago, and the, P, the spreadsheet is literally too large to host on their website. So um, we really just wanted to kind of give the public a glimpse of what they've been doing and make sure that, you know, this data is really getting out there. Um, so we just wanted to, for, for our users to be able to explore it as much as we could provide for them to do that, which is why, you know, there's just like a lot on that map, but they can hover and see the exact racial makeups if they want. They can see the block to the nearest hundred. Um, and then with the narratives, they can just like flick through and just get an idea of what's going on, what these cops are, how they're justifying their stops. Next question. Do we have one from over here? Yes. Do you think uh, it's important to consider more than just race, like socioeconomic factors? Did you, did you look for, like, I'm, I'm not saying this is true, but it could be possible where poor white people are being selected for rich. I think that like is a really good point. And I think the simple answer is it's harder sort of to, you know, map out the socioeconomic status of these people who are being stopped. Um, I think that it really sort of socioeconomic status really goes hand in hand with race. Um, in this case and in the city. Uh, but that's a really good question. I think we could have shown socioeconomic makeups of neighborhoods that these were occurring in because I think, you know, you have a lot of stops across the west side, but you also had a lot happening in Lakeview, which is, you know, one of the 
um, higher socioeconomic status neighborhoods in the city. Um, so that's an interesting point to be made. And I would say we were really focusing on race, but that raises a good point. I mean, is, is there a responsibility when you're building something like this, you're creating an area? Obviously, ACLU has their own things that they do. They want the area to be about race. So if it's not actually about race, it just happens to be convenient to or, or if race is not the only component that needs to be looked at, is, is there a responsibility as they have decided this to actually consider more factors? Right. I mean, I think there's no question that race is a huge factor in this, but I, I do think you raise a valid point. Next question. Uh, so did, they, did the ACLU look at any of the Cook County suburbs that have similar racial breakdowns? I would be really curious. I think they actually did, didn't they, Emily? Downstate. I they were definitely focusing on Chicago, but I think there is a section in the study that breaks down um, other places in the, in the state, like Carbondale, and they certainly compared to other major cities, New York and Los Angeles. Um, but as far as suburbs go, I think that's a great question. I don't know that they address the suburbs. I'm for I for sure know that they address downstate, but yeah. So I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Um, I just had a couple of questions, sort of clarifying the nature of the data for the previous two questions. Uh, so the contact card information that you got didn't have uh, like the residence of the person who was stopped, it just had their race. So even if you couldn't, you could look at the socioeconomic background of where they were stopped, but you don't know anything about the person who was stopped. Is that that's that's correct? Yeah. And then um, also clarifying this: did this data set include traffic stops or just stops of people who were on the street? It included traffic stops for sure, but we definitely looked at that number and determined it wasn't that it wasn't a huge portion of them. It was mostly street stops, and then there it, some of them were marked other. All right. Um, so that's all the questions we have. Can you stick around for a little bit in case people have more and kind of want to? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Sam.